Hello and welcome to a very, very exclusive, amazing, spectacular episode of A Bite Of. I'm Noah, and of course, always joined with me is <laughs> my trouble to my bass clef. <laughs> oh, I was, I, I would have said, uh, you're the maestro to my daddy. <gasps> <laughs> that will make sense later. <laughs> Keep watching. <Yeah. laughs> so today we have a very special interview with the maestro themselves, Jinx Monsoon. I can't wait to get into this. So housekeeping aside, follow us, leave us a rating, follow everything that Jinx is doing. Um, you know the drill by now. So go do that. But we want to give a little background on Jinx and kind of introduce them and start the interview. Yes, absolutely. So you heard our spoiler free review probably something like 10 weeks ago when we couldn't really tell you much other than that we loved Jinx Monsoon. So in this interview, we're able to hear about some background stuff, where they went, how they got the character, um, and just she's just the best. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit about who Jinx is, if you don't know already. You should. Jinx Monsoon is a two time RuPaul's Drag Race winner, award winning actor and recording artist. She made her debut on Broadway in 2023 as Matron Mama Morton in Chicago, breaking box office records during her extended 10-week run. Recently, she starred as Audrey in the off-Broadway production of Little Shop of Horrors and made her Doctor Who debut as the fan-favorite villain, Maestro. Jinx has toured globally with her original cabaret shows alongside major scales and has received numerous accolades, including a Gregory Award, a Mac Award, and the Best Live Theater Award at the 2024 Queerties. And to round it out, most recently, she's been nominated for a Dorian Award for Best Supporting Performance in Drama as the Maestro. Who would have known? Mm. Um, somebody on this podcast might be a part of that voting committee. <laughs> um, I'm not biased at all. <laughs> in, in 2025, she will debut in Carnegie Hall with Jinx Monsoon live at Carnegie Hall. I can't wait for that. I can't wait either. All right. So to get into this interview, very gracious. You know, we were we were slotted for a certain amount of time and we had such a good time that we just kept going. So sit back. We're going to summon the maestro with the devil cord here. So everyone, we are so lucky to be joined by the amazing, the incredible Jinx Monsoon. <laughs> she has put us into her schedule. She is not popping out of a piano. She is just here <laughs> right now. Love. Hi. Thank you for having me. Hi. <laughs> of course. So to get right into this conversation, because we could not wait to talk about this, because when we in initially did it, we had to do spoiler free. But the thing we could talk about is how much we loved your portrayal. So... Getting into the nitty gritty of this at the very beginning, we know that you were basically handpicked by Davies to play Maestro. <laughs> what was your reaction when you received that call, finding out that you were going to be part of Doctor Who? Oh, I mean, it was all very surreal. Even with being front, uh, even being fans with Russell, um, I don't know. You know, it like. Yes, Russell is the showrunner once more and one of the head writers. It's not, uh, I, I don't know all the correct titles, but Russell's a muckety muck, right? And even <laughs> so, you know, he can only do so much. Like, uh, everyone has to agree on something. So even just like, I, I don't get my hopes up until the contract is signed and they're like, it's you, baby. And then I start getting excited. So the first call I had with the writers and producers was just incredible. I mean, I've done some TV and film work, but I've never gotten to play a role in TV or film with so much to it. You know, <laughs> my roles have been fairly humble and um to get to play a role that not and not only is so integral to the overarching plot of the season but also a role that is just i mean there's only so many characters that are written where the actor can really just go nuts with it right and it works and I really had just so much fun because I think that character was so perfect for me to show everyone 
the kind of performance that I like to do and do well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and you absolutely do it well. And I think one of the things that you said was that it was so fun and we as viewers could see how much fun you were having. Mm -hmm. And we were on that journey with you. And I, I was curious, so you, you, the contract sign, you have the role, and now you're handed over the character that is a literal god. How do you prepare to play a god? What is that character study like? Well, I guess, you know, for me, I think one of the things I started thinking a lot about for every character that I play is how much power they have. Um, you know, when you're an actor, you can synthesize so much and you can portray so much. But at the end of the day, you're going to bring your own life experiences to the role, whether you want to or not, right? It's baked mm -hmm. into you. So at this time, when I'm very concerned with where power is going and who has power and who's telling me what kind of power I have versus what power I know I should have <laughs> to get handed a role. Okay. So there's nothing higher than a God. There's nothing. So a God gets to create their own rules. They get to, do whatever they want. I, I, I referred to Maestro as far as how Maestro works, kind of the mechanics and the logic behind Maestro and their abilities and who they are. I honestly was pulling from the genie from Aladdin because I was thinking about the fact that like the genie is all powerful and can do anything he wants and makes his own rules, right? And he still has to play by some rules, but outside of those constraints, he can do whatever the fuck he wants. So I was thinking about characters like that, you know, characters that have given themselves permission or have the permission because they're so goddamn powerful, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what does the genie say? It's infinite cosmic power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and, you know, to be a part of the Pantheon, I was a Greek, the, a Greek mythology nerd as a kid and then a Greek theater nerd as a, as an adult. So I love anything resembling the Pantheon of Greek gods. You know, that has always spoken to me. Something about it taking a whole group of people to create something, you know, like the X-Men. No one X-Men, <laughs> no one mutant is all powerful, but you put them all together and they create something amazing. And I, I love that about the gods. Like they might be extremely powerful, but they all have their thing that they rule over and it takes coming together with other gods to really get things going, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I mean, especially with this new concept of the pantheons being introduced and you're one of the first ones to really be on the screen aside from Neil Patrick Harris as the toy maker, but it was Daddy, just so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have a specific question that has the word yes, daddy in it daddy. coming up. <laughs> um, <laughs> last time we were hanging out, that's the only way I referred to him. Um, no, <laughs> Is that how that's Neil in your contacts on your phone. It just says Daddy Patrick Harris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I texted him the day the episode came out and said, that's it. You're my daddy now. <laughs> it is written in stone. <laughs> <laughs> so going into specific scenes for this episode, you're seen in the alley looking for the Doctor and Ruby. Not only is one of my favorite, like, true villain entrances, mm -hmm. But ever, but I just really want to know what went behind shooting that scene because you did everything from coming down on a rope to looking for them being muted and using a tuning fork. So I just really, how was it like filming that scene? Any, any scenes that are just me on screen or, um, it, it was such a ongoing conversation between myself and the director Ben Chisel who is a lovely Australian guy <laughs> who I just got along with so well. And so basically 
between he and I and, um, you know, everyone else on set working together, we would kind of walk through what needs to happen and kind of choreograph it. And it became very balletic, that first scene, because it was like the cameras had to move in a certain way. And and I took something from the script that Ruby says, that says, um, it's not just music, like uh, how can you dance without music? You know, like music and dance go hand in hand. So I thought, you know, Maestro has a physical form and how would a physical form of music move other than dancing? So coming down on the rope was very theatrical and then moving around the space. You know, I'm not a great ballet dancer, but I did study it for eight years. So I'm glad to put something, put, put it to <laughs> something. Um, so yeah, it's kind of more choreography and then coming up with fun ideas. Like we knew we needed to use the tuning fork and I happened to have this giant ring. And so I think it was Ben's idea to use the ring to hit the tuning fork. And it's just one of those cool moments where it's like, you get into the costume of the character and you get on set and then you open your mind and the work kind of does itself, you know? <laughs> beautiful work, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's a beautiful thing to kind of not keep yourself beholden to what's only written on the page, but allowing yourself to have the freedom to explore. Yeah. Ben, Ben and I, we would get everything we needed on film, you know, like in the can. And then we would typically do one or two more of just going for kind of a completely different idea so that we could either go with the like biggest idea or the idea that definitely works or a melange of the two, you know, <laughs> that's the beauty of film because you get to kind of um, deliver multiple performances and take the best moment from each one and then blend it all to be cohesive to tell mm -hmm. the story you want to tell that's going to last forever. Because on stage, you change the inflection of one word and it can... <laughs> It can affect the joke, you know, comedy's hard. <laughs> you change the way you deliver a line and it means something different. And film is about finding the best way to tell the story you're trying to tell forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Just forever. Just forever. You know, no <laughs> and now... So taking something where you get to kind of piece things together and there's choreography and there's freedom, but then there's things that are set in stone. I wanted to kind of talk about the music battle scene because we mm -hmm. see a lot of that. Again, there's, there's the spinning, there's coming out of pianos, there's going back into pianos. There's a lot of physical work in this role. Did you enjoy doing the stunts? What was, what oh, was that like? Yeah. Jumping into that. I asked to do all of my own stunts and there were some things I wasn't allowed to do for um, safety union-y reasons, but everything I was allowed to do, I did, because I, I really do love the physical work. And, uh, you know, it's what I, when I went to school for theater, um, part of my curriculum was like commedia, commedia dell'arte, clown work, um, we did a lot of physical technique. I was in the best shape of my life in college because it was just part of my curriculum, you know, to use my body to its fullest extent. For years, I've been kind of just standing in place and singing because my work has been in cabaret, you know. <laughs> so to get back into playing characters that get to be very, very physical, I love. Um that scene, I can't even remember how many days it took to shoot that scene, but it was a lot because everything in that, that music room was so much happening at once. So there were special effects to film and there were stunts to film. And then the, the, the instruments was, you know, a whole thing. One of my favorite aspects of the dance, the, 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 the music battle, though, is that I started spinning with the violin 
And I was like, oh, that's fun. And then uh, the director, Ben, was like, do you think you could actually do that? And I was like, sure. And first I was kind of doing it in place. And he was like, what about moving while you do it? And so the next thing I know, I'm faking playing the violin while doing Sinead turns around the piano. And that wasn't in the script. It was like music battle was in the script, but we were really kind of like building that music battle together. Ben, myself and Chutzi and um, Millie. And Russell came in often through the music battle kind of to check in on it and was always so happy. So yeah, in the end, it was like the spinning was like me adding more physical stuff to it to really build the, and I wanted to do something that like, how could a human play, you know, cause it has to be more impressive than just playing a fiddle really well. Right. It has to look like something that a human couldn't do. And so spinning around rapidly while I'm like, <laughs> you know, and what I loved about that whole scene is it just felt like a Looney Tunes moment. It felt like Merry Melodies, you know, it was, it was scary and intense, but also joyful and fun. And oh my gosh, the way Nchuti smiles while he's playing the piano and he's like making those little faces. <laughs> <laughs> take me now <laughs> it's like i'm just gonna keep spinning i'm yeah. just gonna keep spinning around here. <laughs> so speaking of music there's one specific line um in the future or in 2024 when everything's destroyed and in that beautiful purple dress mm -hmm. you sing a song that has the lyrics daddy daddy to me <laughs> did you come specifically talking about the toy maker did you come up with those lyrics or no, no that was in the script wow. and russell talked to me specifically about that song because we were having a day on set where i was just saying how much i was loving this character because this character gets to be powerful and evil and amazing and fabulous and queer and unapologetically so and and we don't spend a lot of time talking about this character's gender this character just comes in that's what it is and that's that fucking love that that's how that was written you know and and so i'm getting this like really fabulous amazing moment at the piano where i'm not only like scary and powerful, but I look amazing, right? And I said, I just, I love that I'm, I've been invited to be so queer on screen and no one's telling me to tone it down. No one's telling me to pull it back or that I'm being too much. Um, and, and then Russell was like, you know, they're really letting us do it all. I wrote a I wrote a song in the script where you sing Daddy Daddied Me and they okayed it. The BBC okayed it. <laughs> we've, <laughs> so, we've come so far. <laughs> I know. And and it's so it's I know that the vitriol from the far right is a response to the progress we've made. We know that our freedom threatens them our freedom frightens them they're jealous i think there's a lot of jealousy here i think a lot of people look at people who have defined gender for themselves and made their own rules around gender regardless of what society tells you your gender has to be people who follow those rules i think whether they know it or not they look at us and think well why do they get to decide why why do i have to dress like the way i've been programmed to dress if they get to decide for themselves because they don't realize you don't have to be trans you don't have to identify as trans you don't have to be queer for gender to be shitty <laughs> gender is shitty for everyone even the people gender norms seem to benefit those people i mean think of straight men 
being cut off from their empathy because that's what they were programmed to be because, and it's a chicken or the egg situation. It's like, do men act this way because that's the only option they're given or are they only given this option because they act this way or, and then it, it's like one side won't change. Like <laughs> I was just talking of, I was in a, uh, a Macy's yesterday and the men's section was black obsidian and it looked like a cave and the lighting was dim and the music was heavy metal. And then you walk into the women's section, it's clean and it's white and it's pearly and it's bright and it's easy and it's breezy. And the music's like, oh, I want to soak up the sun. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I know that the reason that is the way that it is, is because these people think, well, no straight man would come shop here unless we make it look really masculine so that he's not threatened at, by the idea of shopping for clothes for himself. And it's like, but wait, would he not go into a store that isn't designed that way? Or do you just think he wouldn't? And by keeping this up, you're just perpetuating it more and more that men are trapped in this idea that they, if you don't shop at the store that's uber masculine and aggressive, then you're somehow not a man. It's a chicken or an egg thing here. You know, like when did it start? And why does everyone think they have to do it this way? We change so much. We change everything. We change cereal. We change the way things are shipped to us. Why can't gender evolve? And it has. Women wear pants now. And it's <laughs> like, and it's like you do realize that there was a time where women weren't allowed to wear pants. And it's like, if we think about that, that wasn't strictly about queer people. That wasn't strictly about trans people. That was about human beings. Gender affects humans, period. <laughs> period. Period. And I think that's one of the things that like going off of that point, one, you know, just imagine how great the world would be if everybody was just able to express themselves the way that they should express themselves. And one of the things that I loved about this season of Doctor Who is that it felt so new and welcoming and open because we had people on their openly queer people playing roles that you've never seen them in before, or maybe the viewers of Doctor Who have never seen, even though it's been a progressive show in the 60 years it's had, it's even more progressive now than it was before. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because it's like when I think about homo how homogenous and monotonous entertainment has gotten, you know, and how we feel like we've seen everything before. And then I think about what I see in my day-to-day -day life, which is so much more interesting than half the things being put on broad entertainment television, you know, that's being mass produced for everyone to enjoy. And I'm like, the reason why it's boring as fuck is because you're still telling the same stories with the same people over and over. And then when you show diversity, it's still a formula. You're not actually letting people be themselves. Half the time there's a queer character, a trans character that's like a meaningful, impactful character. It's a straight cis person playing it, a straight or a cis person playing it, or sometimes both, because they don't actually want to see the real story. They want to see the palatable story they think that they can handle mm -hmm. or they think that people can handle. And the truth is we are living much more interesting, ridiculous, scary lives than the stories that are being on, you know, like <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't watch a lot of television right now, a lot of new television. So I don't know everything that's being told right now. But I do know when you take a character and you water it down and you neuter it and you try to make it palatable for everyone, then you get away from the truth. And people are so sick of being lied to right now. And the art that is excelling right now is the art that is being created by the artist, produced by the artist, without 
people who are trying to wring every last dollar out of it. It's art that is being made because the person is passionate about the art, not passionate about making money, passionate about the story they want to tell, not passionate about like manipulating people into buying something. And that's the art that is excelling right now because audiences are connecting with authenticity and honesty. And when they go see something that's just a bunch of bullshit, even if they're entertained, they're going to forget about it in a second because their own life is so much more interesting than that boring bullshit. Because we're living in a fucking apocalypse right now and we're in a culture war and I don't want to watch stories that ignore that fact. Amen. hundred percent. And I want to say that I'm going to, I'm going to fan out a little bit here. The, the joy of always watching you being you is the joy is that whenever I've seen you on screen, you are always so authentically yourself. And I think that's why so many of us gravitate towards you because by being yourself, you allow us to have the freedom to express ourselves. So I'm super grateful for that. I'm getting choked up. So thank you. Well, thank you very much because it's not always easy. And at times like this, I'll tell you that even, even, even the heroes you look up to right now are probably scared. You know, even the trans icons who have been fearless and powerful and have fought for us are probably terrified right now because historically popular opinion has never been on our side and now it is and yet we could lose it all easily very easily and it won't be a conversation it won't be a vote it'll just be them taking it away if if they come into power which is i mean is True. I mean, just look at what's been happening. Supreme Court. It's already happening. Right. It's already happening. It's they're laying down all the brickwork and this is just the start. And if we can't stop it, then who knows how far it can go. And I know that there are people who don't think that this affects them. And there are people who maybe even want this to happen because of all the things we've talked about, the fear, the insecurity, the jealousy, the hatred that they've been programmed to have. But the thing is, every story, every piece of art, everything that has to do with this topic has told us our whole lives, the oppressors are the bad ones. And even if momentary good comes from it for the people who want this to happen, When you eradicate all of the problems, you'll find new ones and you won't be safe anymore. You will eventually do something that puts you on the enemy list. And then you will understand what it feels like to have zero autonomy in this situation. So I just want everyone to know that even your icons and your heroes, I'm putting on a brave face because I know that that's how I can help right now, but I am terrified. And I don't know how to stop feeling terrified. So I'm walking down the street every day in this duality of trying to live my goddamn life the way I've always done and keep being authentic and keep being that strong person for my community and keep receiving the love and giving it back out there. While I'm also feeling like there are people who see me as absolute nothing. And there are people who still shout slurs at me walking down the street because they feel empowered and emboldened to do so right now. And what makes me more upset than them is the people who turn away from it, who just don't want to get involved. So I know that there are times when doing the right thing is inconvenient. (laughs) But I mean, come on, humanity is at stake. 
you're going to have to just give up some comforts and luxuries for a moment if that's what's required of you. If things are going to be a little inconvenient for right now, I'm sorry, it's better to be a little inconvenient now than to literally live in a Nazi state later. I just wrote down humanity is at stake. That is real. That is incredibly real. And thank you for your honesty about the duality that you're living in and how we we all, we look up to you, but there you are human and you have fear. And I think that is such a real emotion because this is a very real situation and time that we're living in. So thank you for, for sharing that. Well, you know, I got to say, I, I get through my days with that fear and that, and, and that anger. I have a lot of rage, <laughs> but I get through it with the support of my community, truly. When I go do a show and the stage door is buzzing with people afterward, people who are like me, who just want to know that there's a place in the world for them down the down the line down the road you know young people wanting to just be themselves in the future and i know that when i invest in my community my community invests in me so i get through this year and the anger because i know that i have my community and i think one thing that i'm finding very sad is that I think what leads people down this path of hatred and this path of bigotry is not having a community like I have, like the queer community. Or if they have a community, it's so small and so insular that they're not meeting different people. They're just meeting other people like themselves. And the most beautiful thing about the queer community is it's global. Queer people exist everywhere. Whether it's safe for them to exist there or not, they exist there. And if you got rid of us all today, more would be born. It doesn't go away. It's not a thing that you can eradicate. It's just part of existence. <laughs> Queerness. Okay? So knowing that my community spans the globe means that I'm always trying to think about how one thing affects everyone in that community. And my community in, includes trans people and cis people and women and men and people of color and people of privilege and people of faith. And I try to think about what's going to affect all of us. But when you have, when you're a part of a community that's just five people who look the same as you, you're, you lose touch with your empathy and your compassion for other people because you're not thinking about them. You have, and then you convince yourself you have no reason to think about them. But the thing is, we all are part of a global community. We live on Earth, and it's dying, and a lot of people are being really crappy roommates right now. A hundred percent. And I think that's the importance of a show like Doctor Who, especially this new season, is that it offers folks a window to see other people and other experiences. And that's why we need this type of media, because sometimes you are just standing in a room of five other people that look like yourself. You need to look out into the world and look out into that through that window. Absolutely. And sometimes our circumstances don't allow us chances to meet other people. And that's why art has to continue to tell the truth. Art has to continue to be honest. Art has to continue to mean something. And like you said, be a window into the rest of the world, you know, especially when we've been programmed to uh, uh, get so much of our understanding of the world through our entertainment. <laughs> you know, America's two biggest exports are war and entertainment, I think. So it's like we get a lot of what we know about how the world works through our entertainment. And now it's even entertainment like TikTok and YouTube and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> and I just encourage people to watch the stuff that shows them things they don't normally get to see or things they don't normally think about. And I say that being a person who doesn't watch a lot of 
TV, but I live a lot of life. <laughs> you know, I, it's an exchange. If you're not traveling the globe, watch a documentary, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> that's the advice watch a documentary for god's sake that's the advice <laughs> i was hoping that we could i know we're a little limited on time is it okay to sort of get into our lightning yes round yes yes, of yes. Questions? i'm a talker so go for it i'll well, be lightning. And we're, <laughs> i'll be lightning and we're gonna try and catch you in a bottle um, one, okay wait, so. before before we get into it, i did want to ask this one oh, question because oh, oh. we do ask um our guests this just just to kind of see outside of what we're talking about. Um, what are you currently like obsessed with? What are you currently indulging in? It could be food. It could be music. It could be anything. Um, well, I'm a high functioning stoner, um, but that's kind of constant. So that's not like a new thing, but um, what am I indulging in? Okay. So I've been, uh, okay. My, Guiltiest pleasure is the TV show American Dad. <laughs> um, and I have a communist socialist friend who loves American Dad for his reason. <laughs> so when he comes over, I watch it with him and it's like watching it through new eyes. And he sits there and gets really into the plots. And <laughs> so I already like American Dad, but I guess right now what I'm obsessed with is showing it to people who don't normally watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um i also i play a lot of video games and i go through phases but i have been on a long long like the only game i have like the attention span for right now is overwatch and so it's like i wake up i play about three rounds of overwatch and then i start my day <laughs> so <laughs> that is literally me every morning. Who do you <laughs> mostly play? I do have to ask that follow up question. <laughs> me too. <laughs> but lately, I've been really kicking ass at Diva, which was the first character I played as. And I'm trying to get better at DPS. And so Symmetra is my go to DPS, but I'm trying to get better with Ash because they just released that like Rita Repulsa inspired costume. Yes. And I'm like, I never play as Ash, but now I need to get good at her just so I can wear that costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i i can't even think of like maybe we've been in the same match together and i just didn't even know <laughs> okay this is uh, last thing and then please the lightning round but um yesterday okay so my uh, my overwatch tag my like battle net tag is just jinx right my i'm jinx monsoon and i play as jinx right and then sometimes i see gamer tags and i'm like Okay, well, I know that's probably not Nicki Minaj, but I am Jinx, and my name on here is Jinx, so it could be Nicki Minaj. I could have just won a match with The Weeknd. I don't know. That's the beauty of Overwatch. <laughs> Jinx, Noah, Noah was just playing yesterday morning, and he goes, someone's name is Nicki Minaj. I don't know if it's Nicki Minaj. It could be Nicki Minaj. Um, I will <laughs> say this, though. Um, uh, Jonan Vasquez, uh, 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 I probably just butchered his name, but the creator of Invader Zim. Invader Zim. He's a pal, and we. Well, it's been a while, but we used to play Overwatch together. <laughs> and my teenage brain was freaking out because Invader Zim was my favorite thing at like 12, 13 years old. And the fact that my adult self is now playing Overwatch <laughs> with its creator is really surreal. Anyway, lightning round, go. All right, let's go to the <laughs> lightning round. All right, so these were sent in from our listeners. We had quite a few to choose from. So the first one, did you take anything from set of Doctor Who? No, no, I didn't. No, <laughs> none well, of those give outfits. You something. No. Right, <laughs> it all goes because Doctor Who is what it is. It all all goes into the archives because you never know when there might be a museum exhibit about it. You know? <laughs> all right, I want to be the Doctor Who archive uh, archivist. That's awesome. <laughs> next question: What was your favorite scene to shoot? Mm, uh, de, de, my my entrance scene because I got to fly because I got to be rigged up and I told them if I ever come back to the show we need about 25 to 50% more flying for my character 
Can I we said just I have... never want to touch the ground. <laughs> Can we just have the maestro constantly floating in That's every scene? That's my hope. <laughs> That's the power of the maestro. Uh, the next question is, what other series or films would you love to play a villain in? Oh, oh I'm going to manifest something here. My favorite book is called Circe by Madeline Miller. And I've heard whispers that it's going to be made into a series. So I'd play a villain. I'd play anything uh, in Circe. It was, Circe is one of my favorite mythical witches. Anyway, uh, so Circe. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, I have so many things and now I can't think of any of them. Oh, I'd be a villain on Bridgerton, hands down. Get me in a period <laughs> yeah. piece. That's what I want to do. I'd play a fop in Bridgerton. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like a rich fop who, who, who does drag privately, you know, because that's rich people have always been doing everything that rich people are now trying to ban. And you know what? The things that they're trying to ban, they'll probably still keep doing it. You think the, you think the closeted Republicans aren't still going to have their gay lovers? No, they're not going to give up a goddamn thing. Anyway, go on. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every straight man I slept with, go on. <laughs> How many nickels? How uh, many nickels? Mama, <laughs> I wouldn't have needed to win RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Twice. Twice. <laughs> so, next question, which we got a lot of, are you coming back as the maestro? I don't get to say anything about that because I don't know. And I actually do really want to respect the process. Um, I don't want to interfere with the storyline of a show that I personally love. Um, that said, while I was on set for the Maestro, um, Maestro's first appearance, I was constantly pitching like, well, you know, Maestro could come back in this way. Well, you know, Maestro doesn't really die in the end. They're just banished. Well, we have kind of established that Maestro has a little bit of the hots for the doctor, so... You know, like, <laughs> it's right there. So it's I, right I, there. I've definitely been planting the seeds. <laughs> I mean, a spinoff with you and Missy. Why not? Please let me work with Michelle Gomez. I also said that I'd come I'd come back to the show in any capacity, like if they wanted me to play a different character, if they wanted me in prosthetics. I mean, God, I'll play a stretch of skin if I have to. I love being a part of Dr. <laughs> <laughs> And the people want you to be continue to be a part of Doctor <laughs> Who. That is the truth. Um, so the next question we got is a little away from Doctor Who. What is next for you, Jinx Monsoon? Um, I have kind of been answering this question the same way, which is I really just love what I'm doing and I want to keep doing more of it. Like I want to keep doing more TV and film roles. I want to keep doing more Broadway. It's like I have hit the point where that I have worked my whole life to get to. And I'm really happy to just kind of park it here for a bit. You know, I like what I'm doing and I want to keep doing more of it. I love creating the holiday show with Dela every year because it's something, you know, it's this balance of getting to do scripted, established work and then create my own work and find that both things are very important, you know, like uh, keeping these important stories alive with fresh perspectives, incredibly important because when we already know the story and we already connect with it, but we see a new perspective, it hits us different because we already like understand the story, but now we understand how it could apply to someone completely different from what we first considered. Right. Um, that happened with Little Shop and Audrey. Um, people started really kind of seeing transcoding in the character of Audrey after seeing um, MJ Rodriguez and myself portray uh, portray this character that I now believe was written with transcoding in it. Like I now believe that Howard Ashman based Audrey off of either a drag queen or a trans um, woman 
that he might have known and couldn't have put into the show at the time as a trans character. So made her cis, but let her be a fucking <laughs> cartoon character, you know, like Audrey is, right? Um, and uh, so I think that's very important. Uh, telling our beloved stories from a fresh perspective. And we're seeing a lot of that. And that's the only kind of reboot I want to see. If you're going to reboot something to just like make it look the same as it was before, there's no fucking point. Um, and then uh, creating your own work is, uh, it, it allows me to talk about what's happening that year. It allows me to talk about what's happening in our community and it allows, when I create my own work, that's where all my rage goes. Like, I take all my rage and I push it through the funny filter and it becomes comedy. And the message is clear, but I, instead of yelling into the void, I, 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 I make my audiences laugh and think. <laughs> <laughs> so where we wanted to end this uh we got a lot of messages and comments that weren't even questions and we wanted to echo this as well they a lot of people said we don't really have a question we just wanted to say how much we loved jinx's performance as the maestro <laughs> and how much it means so much to people um, and we got a couple that were, I didn't even you know, know about Jinx, and now I do because of Doctor Who. Um, but so we wanted to echo that same sentiment um, of just how amazing you were and how much we love it. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you. And, and just, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, <laughs> I was saying just how happy, happy we are to see you continuing on this successful track that you're on and just bringing the Jinx of you <laughs> into the world. So thank you. Well, I just want to echo what I've said, which is my community has really, really uh, made me feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be and that I'm doing it with a purpose and that it means something more than just having a dream fulfilled. You know, like to to make it to a place that I wanted to be as the person I wanted to be that I first saw for myself at a very young age, but kind of thought might never happen. And at points in my life accepted would never happen. And now to be here and to be like me, you know, and, and, and to be becoming every day more myself than the me that I've always seen for myself. It's the support from the community that makes it, feel like more than just getting my rocks off you know it's like knowing that it has a purpose and that if I show up and do my best work that's me serving my community like it's like I don't have to bring queerness and transness into everything I do for it to have a positive impact with the queer community. I just have to do the jobs I'm hired to do to the best of my ability to show everyone, this is what queer people bring to the table. And if you like this, there's a lot more queer, talented, trans, drag performers who have a lot to share as well. <laughs> you know? Like, I don't want anything to ever just be the novelty of having it once. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I want this to be opening a door and a window and a garage. <laughs> Open everything. <laughs> I want people to see that, like, the more diversity we bring into our art and entertainment, the better it gets. And then I want them to realize that that's true for everything. That's that's all the questions we have. <laughs> I can't believe how generous you were with your time. This has been well. I had amazing. fun talking to you. Yet. <laughs> I wouldn't still be here if I was irritated. <laughs> <laughs> there could have been more Wi-Fi trouble. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are just so proud of you, um, and so grateful for you as a human and for your time and, and giving us 
yourself in, in this time. So thank you so much, Jinx. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm sure you'll have a lot of British people watching this because it's Doctor Who. But if you're watching this and you live in America, um, vote and vote wisely. And there is a right choice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to end it right there. <laughs>